Number 7. Leslie Chance Leslie Chance had her first child with her high school sweetheart, whom she broke up with following his infidelity. A few years later, she met security guard Todd and they got married. Leslie had her second daughter, Sarah, with Todd. History would repeat itself when it came to her spouse's fidelity as Leslie found that he'd begun to exchange flirtatious messages with his former fiance. Leslie devised a meticulous plan to get revenge. On August the 25th of 2013, Todd's body was found in an almond orchard in Bakersfield, California, with two bullet holes in the chest region. Given the careful preparation had taken place prior to Todd's killing, the authorities struggled to connect the pieces of the puzzling case. However, footage of a disguised Leslie from security cameras in a Starbucks emerged and showed her carrying a cylindrical container of bleach wipes. She became the prime suspect. In spite of the new revelations, prosecutors still found it hard to sentence the woman. She'd apparently attended a CSI exhibition while on vacation with her husband and daughters and learned how to get rid of DNA evidence. The investigation suggested that Leslie had driven Todd's car to the orchard, executed him and abandoned the body. She then also abandoned his Mustang, which was found in front of a known drug house in a suspiciously clean state. As a school principal, Leslie was earning considerably more than Todd at the time of the murder. Rather than divorcing him and having to pay alimony, she decided to kill him and cash in on his $250,000 life insurance policy. Following multiple delays in her trial, she was eventually sentenced to 50 years to life in prison in 2020. Number 6. Mark Morris Just days after her 33rd birthday, on May the 25th of 2017, Emma Day was stabbed to death in broad daylight in South London by her abusive ex-partner, Mark Morris. Their intermittent relationship had been going on for roughly eight years and they had a child together. Day had been seeking a $2,700 check per year from Mark Morris's alimony. Prior to murdering her, Morris had threatened the woman's life, telling her, I'll go to prison before you get a penny from me. An inquest later revealed that the Department for Work and Pensions was aware of the threats but had failed to raise the alarm, fearing for her life. Day withdrew the child maintenance claim she'd put forward in November of 2016. Morris was enraged when it became evident that her request would be approved after she'd resubmitted it a few years later. He ambushed her in West Norwood as she was returning home from a school run. Morris stabbed Day repeatedly, inflicting fatal injuries. In the killing's aftermath, some argued that the system had failed Day two weeks before her death. The police decided they'd take no further action against Morris following an unsuccessful arrest inquiry. The man, aged 39, appeared at Camberwell Magistrates Court, where he was convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 21 years served. Number 5. Carrie Neuer Reuter and Lloyd Neuer Reuter In late 2018, Carrie Neuer Reuter pleaded guilty to second-degree manslaughter for aiding her father in the killing of her mother, Michelle, in the town of Corning, New York State. The murder had taken place a year prior, after the 19-year-old's father, Lloyd Neuer Reuter, told her that he could no longer afford to pay child support to his ex-wife. The couple had three children, one of whom was a minor still living with Michelle. Lloyd also reportedly wanted custody of the child after an unsuccessful legal battle that had lasted several years. Carrie was given an ultimatum by her manipulative father, who claimed that he'd take his own life if the team wouldn't help him carry out the killing. She made her choice and drove Lloyd from his hotel in Rochester to her mother's home in Corning. Brooks Baker, the district attorney for Steuben County, would later argue that she'd been essentially brainwashed and that she suffered from parental alienation syndrome, where one parent convinces a child to completely devaluate the other. Lloyd had mentally molded Carrie into his ally for years. After arriving at the Corning residence, he strangled 46-year-old Michelle to death in her bedroom and elicited Carrie's help to make it look like she'd taken her own life. Evidence would slowly mount against him as investigators found he'd stopped in Rochester, even though he claimed to have been in California at the time of the murder. 46-year-old Lloyd pleaded guilty to charges of first-degree murder, first-degree custodial interference, and second-degree conspiracy, for which he was given a life sentence. Carrie was convicted for her role in the killing and paroled after serving one year in prison. Number 4. Death of Walter L. Scott On April the 5th of 2015, Walter Lamar Scott, age 50, 
was shot by a police officer, Michael Slager, in North Charleston, South Carolina. Scott, who in the 1980s had served two years in the Coast Guard, had initially been pulled over by Slager for a non-functioning taillight. As Slager went back to his patrol car, Scott got out of his 1991 Mercedes and ran away. A warrant had been out for his arrest since early 2013, relating to child support payments. He'd already been jailed three times for missing alimony and knew that he'd have to face serious legal consequences if he again ended up in a courtroom. Overtaken by the anxiety associated with his predicament, he fled with Slager in pursuit. The officer caught up with him in a lot behind a pawn shot. A struggle ensued in which Slager shot Scott with a taser. The latter started to run away when the officer shot at him from behind eight times with his 45 caliber Glock 21. Five bullets made contact, one of which fatally struck his heart and lung. A few moments after the shooting, Slager would radio that Scott had tried to grab his taser. This would prove to be a lie. As confirmed by an eyewitness video, Scott was already fleeing and 15 to 20 feet from the officer when he was shot. Fired in Santana, who'd recorded the video on his cell phone, claimed that at no point had Scott tried to grab the taser. The video also appeared to indicate that Slager had picked something up, possibly the taser, from where the altercation first occurred and then dropped it next to Scott's body. Given that Scott was a black man and Slager a white police officer, it was suggested that the killing had been racially motivated, which sparked widespread controversy. Two years after the shooting in 2017, Slager was sentenced to 20 years in prison for second-degree murder. Number 3. Darren Boswell Johnson In February of 2016, Darren Boswell Johnson killed his ex-wife, Nashante Davis, and their daughter over $600 per month in alimony. He had been trying to get out of the arrangement and first resorted to the internet for answers to his situation, but seemingly found no legal course of action he deemed acceptable. Consequently, he resorted to extreme measures and went to his ex's apartment with a fully loaded gun for what he claimed would just be a discussion. He waited until 26-year-old Davis got out of her house in Fort Washington, Maryland, and ambushed her as she was putting their daughter Chloe into the car. The moment she refused to talk to him, he shot her twice and then gunned down the child as well. Boswell Johnson fled from the scene and discarded the weapon used in the double murder. Even after being picked up by the police for questioning, the man continued to maintain his innocence. It was only after the authorities showed him CCTV footage that he gave up a confession. He was ultimately sentenced to two consecutive life sentences for first-degree murder. Today's topic was inspired by Arcane 917, Katie Marino and Mr. Midget 612. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Michael Camerata In early April of 2019 in Staten Island, New York, Michael Camerata enlisted the help of his girlfriend, Aisha Ejia, to kill his estranged wife, Janine. The murder was only discovered after Janine's charred remains were found in a storage unit in Arden Heights. She'd last been seen alive on March the 30th as she was leaving the home of her then-boyfriend. It's believed that she'd gone to meet Michael and see her children. The couple were in the process of ending their tumultuous marriage and Michael, who'd been abusive towards Janine in the past, would have had to pay child support. Janine disappeared just two days after she'd served him with divorce papers. An investigation revealed that Michael, Aisha and Janine sat in the latter's car where what had begun as a discussion devolved into an argument and then a physical altercation. Aisha, who was pregnant at the time and seated in the back, would later tell the authorities that she'd tried to break the two up. However, her efforts proved fruitless as Michael shot his wife dead. He subsequently told the authorities that Janine was fine when he left her. However, all the evidence, including Aisha's testimony and surveillance from the storage unit where Janine's body had been discovered, indicated otherwise. Aisha and Michael, both in their early 40s, were each charged with second-degree murder, concealment of a human corpse, and tampering with physical evidence. Number 1. Fred Lee Following Fred Lee's divorce from his wife, Joy Ellis Sidwell, which had been finalized in 2009, a court ordered that he be paid $500 a month in alimony. The couple had been married for 30 years and had three adult daughters. Lee had sustained a head injury at some point in his life, which had rendered him incapable of working. However, the court-ordered fee wasn't enough for Lee who still harbored a grudge against his ex. 
which he manifested by stalking and harassing her. In July of 2014, he made his way to Sidwell's residence, armed with a handgun and a shotgun, looking to end her life. By approaching the woman's home, he violated a stalking injunction, which had been in effect for nine months. Rather than finding joy, however, Lee encountered Mike, Sidwell's new husband. He attempted to stop Lee from entering the home, but his efforts were to no avail as he was executed in cold blood. The authorities were alerted and they arrived at the scene to arrest 59-year-old Lee. In the aftermath, he pleaded guilty to first-degree felony murder, first-degree felony aggravated burglary, second-degree felony stalking, and third-degree domestic violence. The charges amounted to 21 years in prison. Even though he'd murdered her husband, Sidwell still had to pay Lee alimony and was forced to petition a court in order to have the order rescinded. Number 7. Suge Knight Marion Suge Knight Jr. is a former music industry mogul, best known for co-founding Death Row Records alongside Dr. Dre. Once revered as a king of the West Coast hip-hop scene, Suge has a long criminal history. It has led him to a 28-year prison sentence, which he received in September of 2018. His criminal activity can be traced to the late 1980s, when he was arrested for domestic violence after assaulting his girlfriend on the street. Around this time, he also stole a vehicle while armed with a gun. During the auto theft, he fired three times at the driver, which led him to also be charged with attempted murder. Another notable controversy in which Suge was involved concerned the death of artist Tupac Shakur in 1996. Suge was driving a vehicle with Shakur, who was signed to Death Row Records at the time, when they were attacked. Tupac was shot dead by the assailants, and Suge survived with grazes from the bullets fired. Suge was sentenced to nine years in prison for violating his parole, but served five. In 2006, Suge filed bankruptcy, both for himself and Death Row Records. He reportedly claimed debts of over $100 million. In 2014, his former business partner at Death Row, Dr. Dre, sued him for over $3 million for unpaid royalties. In 2015, Suge was arrested on suspicion of murder. A fatal hit-and-run incident had occurred, leaving one man dead. Suge was the prime suspect in the investigation. He pleaded no contest to a charge of voluntary manslaughter in 2018. He was sentenced to 28 years in prison and will be eligible for parole in July of 2037. Number 6. Harvey Weinstein Harvey Weinstein was a powerful Hollywood film producer who was infamously brought to justice following the Me Too movement. His career started when Harvey and his brother Bob founded entertainment powerhouse Miramax, which was eventually acquired by Disney for $80 million. The brothers then went on to create The Weinstein Company, where they continued to produce films. Throughout his career, Harvey received numerous awards and praise from the film industry. An analysis of Oscar acceptance speeches showed he'd been thanked or praised 34 times between 1996 and 2016. Interestingly enough, during that time period, God was mentioned the same amount of times by Oscar winners. Weinstein's fall from grace began in October of 2017, when media publications reported that more than a dozen women had accused him of various degrees of abuse. Weinstein denied the claims against him, claiming all interactions had been consensual. Momentum against Weinstein had started to build, however, and this was compounded by a viral tweet. It was posted by actress Alicia Milano, the tweet encouraged women with similar experiences to speak up using the hashtag MeToo. Milano also confirmed that she'd experienced similar abuse. It didn't take long before an astounding number of women in Hollywood came forward with similar allegations against Weinstein, some with reports going back decades. Outside of Hollywood, thousands of women worldwide came forward with their own stories, speaking out against men who had abused their positions of power. As a result of the allegations, Weinstein was fired from his production company, suspended from prestigious film organizations and stripped of awards. Weinstein attempted to counter the wave of allegations through intimidation, allegedly hiring a private intelligence firm. The firm gathered personal sensitive information on those who had accused Weinstein in an attempt to pressure the victims into silence. Despite over 80 individual abuse allegations against him, Weinstein has always pleaded not guilty. In February of 2020, he was convicted of the crimes that could be backed by evidence, 
and was sentenced to 23 years in prison. Number 5. Paris Hilton Paris Hilton is a famous socialite and media mogul who has created a multi-million dollar brand for herself. Great-granddaughter of Conrad Hilton, founder of Hilton Hotels, she was cast into the limelight since childhood. Paris began modeling as a child and mixed with the likes of Kim Kardashian, who she is good friends with. Paris is no stranger to controversy. The most notable scandal involved a videotape of a sensitive nature, which was leaked onto the internet in 2003. In 2006, she was charged for drunk driving. Her driving license was suspended and she was placed on probation. Not long afterwards, she was caught speeding at night with no headlights on. She was sentenced to 45 days in jail for violating her probation, but was freed shortly after. She carried out the remainder of her sentence with an electronic tag. Paris was also heavily criticized for inflammatory comments she'd made in a taxi, which many deemed homophobic. These comments were recorded and may have been leaked by the taxi driver. She's apologized publicly for any offense caused. Number 4. Nicki Minaj Nicki Minaj is one of the music industry's most acclaimed female rappers with over 100 million units sold worldwide. She is also the highest paid female rapper of all time. Aside from her achievements, the Trinidad-born star has been involved in controversy over the years. At a New York Fashion Week party, she and singer Cardi B became embroiled in a physical fight. It resulted in Cardi B sustaining a prominent bump on her forehead and both women being escorted out. Reportedly, the feud was linked to interactions on social media. She has also feuded with fellow female rap artist Lil' Kim, both alternatively alleging that the other had copied their style. The two artists have subtly provoked each other for years. Number 3. Bernie Madoff Bernie Madoff was a Wall Street financial mogul who became infamous after he was caught operating one of the largest Ponzi schemes the world has ever seen. The scheme was uncovered by the FBI and the SEC in 2008. Investors who unknowingly participated in the illegal scheme are estimated to have lost more than $50 billion over a 20-year period. Madoff's career began in the 1960s when he had started trading penny stocks. He soon formed a business, Bernard L. Madoff Investment Securities, LLC. It would later become one of the biggest penny stock brokerage firms on Wall Street. Madoff, as an advisor, also worked alongside his brother, Peter. Together, they created trading software, which was adopted by the NASDAQ exchange. Later in 1990, Bernie himself served as a chairman of the NASDAQ exchange. By the 1990s, Bernie's brokerage firm was processing between 10 and 15% of all trading orders on the New York Stock Exchange. Madoff had become one of the elites on Wall Street. Bernie's brokerage firm also offered wealth management, it was on this side of the business that he operated his Ponzi scheme. Promising investors huge returns, he operated it in a deceptive manner. Madoff would pay investors phony returns using the money of more recent investors. Whilst doing so, he would pocket a large portion of funds, funneling them directly into his personal bank account. Madoff had managed to keep his scheme under wraps for two decades. Despite even the SEC investigating him on numerous occasions, nothing had come to light until 2008. During the financial crisis, investors flocked to cash out their investments. Madoff didn't have enough funds to pay them all and was arrested once the news broke out. The crimes committed by Madoff didn't just have financial implications as they took a very real human toll. Individual fortunes were wiped out and even charities were ruined by Madoff's greed. He became so hated that he had to wear a bulletproof vest to court. On the second anniversary of Bernie's arrest, one of his sons, Mark, killed himself. For his crimes, Madoff was sentenced to 150 years in prison, effectively a life sentence. In April of 2021, he passed away in prison from natural causes. Today's topic was requested by JG. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Rupert Murdoch Rupert Murdoch is a media tycoon who is considered one of the most powerful and influential people in the industry. Murdoch inherited a chain of Australian newspapers when he was just 22 years old. This was after the unexpected passing of his father, Sir Keith Murdoch. Through a series of lucrative acquisitions and expansions, Murdoch created a media empire worth billions of dollars. Media companies in this empire include Sky News, Fox News and The Wall Street Journal, as well as The Sun and The Times. 
because of his influence and control of the media, Murdoch has been heavily criticized and the subject of multiple scandals. His papers and television channels have been accused of being biased and misleading. Many believe that they were used as a tool to fuel Murdoch's own political and business agendas. One of Murdoch's publications, the now discontinued News of the World, was involved in a major scandal in the 2000s. Employees at the publication were accused of hacking people's phones to gather exclusive information for news stories. Celebrities, politicians and even members of the British royal family became victims of the scandal. After the revelations were made, the publication was discontinued, resulting in the loss of 200 jobs. A number of convictions and arrests followed. Rupert Murdoch stepped down from his position at the publication, admitting a cover-up had taken place to hide the scale of the scandal. Number 1. Peter Nygaard Peter Nygaard is a fashion industry mogul who was arrested in 2020, originally from Finland. Nygaard founded Nygaard International, a company that makes women's clothing. Going back to at least 1978, he has been involved in legal controversy, both in his business and personal life. Nygaard has been accused of various crimes, including human trafficking, racketeering, and abuse against minors. Since 1995, he's allegedly used his influence and money to recruit victims to gratify himself and his friends. They were often vulnerable and from disadvantaged backgrounds, making them easier to manipulate. Nygaard has been known to silence accusations against him by paying his victims off. In 2020, Nygaard had a wave of numerous abuse allegations made against him. New York court documents show he has at least 57 alleged victims that are seeking damages for abuse spanning decades. In December of 2020, Nygaard was arrested in Winnipeg, Canada, under the Extradition Act. He faces a class action lawsuit for his alleged crimes, but has maintained that he's innocent. Number 9. Terence Watanabe Known as the biggest whale in Las Vegas history, Terence Watanabe made fast work of his multi-million dollar wealth, gambling and drinking in casinos. After selling his father's company of which he had made his fortune, Terence made a name for himself amongst casinos as a lavish spender. In 2007, his betting spree peaked and he went on a record-breaking losing streak, gambling away $825 million. Just one year in, he netted a loss of $204 million across the Rio and Caesars casinos and fled the city broke in 2008 with an unpaid bill of $15 million. His total spending amassed to an astounding 5.6% of the casino company's total revenue that year. Caesars ultimately sued and pressed felony charges against Terence for his unpaid bill, which was settled out of court with Terence agreeing to pay back $100,000 of the $15 million he owed. Later, Caesars was fined $225,000 for not appropriately taking action and even encouraging Terence's multiple addictions. Reports suggest that they had given Terence thousands in incentives, let him play intoxicated and even plied him with painkillers to keep him at the table. His tale is a cautionary one. Despite living like a king for a few years, Terence had to resort to setting up a GoFundMe in 2017 for a life-saving surgical procedure that he could no longer afford. Number 8. Andros Townsend Andros Townsend is a professional football player in the English Premier League who played for the likes of Tottenham Hotspur and now Crystal Palace. Near the beginning of his career, before he had truly established himself as a player, Townsend developed a worrying gambling habit. As he was being bounced between teams on loans, he turned to betting apps as a way of passing time out of boredom. The pastime quickly spiraled out of control and led to him losing over $64,000 in a single bet the night before a playoff game in 2012. At the height of his addiction while on loan to Birmingham, Townsend admitted that when he arrived, he couldn't even afford the hotel parking lot costs to sleep in his car. The lowest point of his career came soon after when in 2013, he was charged by the Football Association on 76 counts of gambling charges. He received a four-month ban, a $25,000 fine and court-ordered counseling. Rather than ruining his career, he was caught and forced into therapy. This was a pivotal turning point in his life. He went on to make 13 appearances for the English national squad, scoring three goals. In 2019, Townsend became outspoken about his history with gambling and its persistence in the football industry, 
claiming that in every dressing room he's been in, there's been a player with a gambling addiction. Number 7. Craig Walden What started as the occasional bet on a sports match for Craig Walden turned into a full-fledged gambling addiction in March of 2020, after the onset of the coronavirus pandemic. Taking his love of sports to the next level, the 27-year-old native of Whitchurch, England, accrued a debt of over $55,000 in a month, having lost almost $30,000 in one night alone. Living by himself and cut off from his support systems during the nationwide lockdowns, Craig became attached to his screen. His addiction, like an avalanche, quickly took over his life and all his savings. He lost everything and, chasing the losses, he kept gambling, borrowing money and getting even more into debt. At his lowest point, Craig admitted he'd considered taking his own life but instead turned to family and friends. They were able to help get him the help he needed and Craig then started the journey of recovering from his harrowing addiction and sizable debt. Number 6. Cohen Everink 42-year-old businessman Cohen Everink made his millions as the founder and director of the travel company Eliza Was Here. In 2016, he was found dead in his home by his six-year-old daughter who'd heard his screams. It appeared as if he'd been stabbed to death and following the money, police quickly found a suspect. They arrested Mark de Jong, who at the time was the head coach to top tennis player Robin Haas. De Jong had borrowed thousands of euros from Everink to fuel his gambling addiction and the judge found him guilty of murder. He was also charged for the theft of one of Everink's valuable watches and was sentenced to 18 years in prison. During his trial, it was made explicitly clear that De Jong knew Everink's daughter was close by in another room. De Jong denied the murder charge and attempted to appeal his case to the Supreme Court, who vehemently dismissed it. Number 5. Justin Larkham In just three years' time, Justin Larkham from Britain went from having a beautiful wife, two kids, and a home in Tunbridge Wells to living in Kent with his mother. In 2009, the ex-military major placed a small bet of $7 on a rugby match, but the thrill soon caught on and spiraled into a full-on addiction. Placing high-stake bets of up to $7,000 on various sites, Larkham squandered over a million dollars and racked up a debt of almost $140,000. After using up his savings, his family's money, and the equity of their house, Larkham was still convinced he could win and charged his company's credit cards until he was caught and fired. Upon losing his six-figure city job, the rest soon followed. In 2012, his wife discovered the extent of his actions and left him, taking their two sons with her. That was the last of their house, fancy cars, and lush vacations. A day before he was due to be evicted, his mother came to his rescue and took him back to Kent. Larkham eventually paid off his debts and reunited with his wife, but will never forget losing $24,000 on a single bet. Number 3. Ryan Myers 27-year-old gambling addict and carpenter Ryan Myers had been secretly gambling away thousands of dollars for years before taking his own life in 2014. Myers seemed happy and normal during a recent vacation with family, but two days prior to his death, he posted a cryptic message on Facebook, apologizing for letting people down. His family put the pieces together after his death and realized how much trouble he had been in. At least three times under his fiancée's nose, Ryan scrambled and borrowed to pay bills after squandering all his wages. But Ryan knew he was addicted. Going through his emails, his family discovered an inbox riddled with promotional ads but also clear signs he was trying to get out. Ryan had emailed several gambling sites in an attempt to self-exclude from them, in which addicts can request to be banned from gambling for a period of time. He had also reached out to a recovered addict named James Petherick, who had documented his own struggles on YouTube. In one message, Ryan admitted to James that the constant barrage of ads and promotional betting offers was making it next to impossible to resist the urge to gamble. Despite his efforts, it all became too much when he lost nearly $700 on a fixed-odd betting terminal. Years after his death, Ryan's email account still received adverts and offers of free bets, encouraging him to come back and play. Today's topic was requested by Silent Winds, Kim Jeffrey, Adrian Moe, Mr. Phantom 3232 and 
Manuel Rodriguez. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. David Bradford Harboring a hidden gambling addiction, David Bradford's wife and three children weren't aware of his indiscretions until he was sent to jail on his wife's birthday, April 11th, 2014. David had spent years living this double life and had racked up a debt of over $696,000. At that point, he had stolen almost $70,000 from his employer, taken out several loans, and remortgaged his house. The lies to his family went as far as pretending to be a witness at his own trial, but upon sentencing and conviction, the ruse was up. A phone call to his family home from a solicitor informed them that David had been jailed for fraud. Thus, the web of lies unraveled. In the end, he lost his $100,000 a year job as a finance controller and was put behind bars for eight months. David admitted that until the judge told him he had a problem, he never thought he was addicted. Instead, David remembers thinking that he was just bad with money and even placed a bet on the day of his court case. David sought help while in jail and despite struggling to find work after his release, created an app to help others addicted to gambling. Faced with a mountain of debt, David and his wife will likely be paying it off for the rest of their lives. Number 1. Jalal Udin Gambling addict and father of three, Jalal Udin often fought with his wife, Asma Begum, about money. The couple had been married since 2007 and lived together in a flat in East London. To his wife, Udin was known for always asking for money and to his local bookkeepers, he was known to get very angry when he lost. On January the 11th, 2019, after being asked to withdraw £200 from Begum's account for family expenses, Udin returned with no money or food, having gambled it all away. The ensuing fight between the couple turned violent. Udin stabbed his wife in the face, head and neck upwards of 60 times then left her to die. Her left hand had been left practically amputated at the wrist, and a trained pathologist struggled to accurately count the sheer number of stab wounds. Begum was found by concerned relatives and pronounced dead at the scene. Hours later, Udin turned himself in, telling police, my wife hurt me. In court, Udin claimed Begum came at him with the knife first, but doesn't remember what happened next or why his bloodied shirt ended up in the bath. Throughout the trial, he denied the murder charge, but the judge ultimately found him guilty and sentenced him to life in prison. Number 8. Yamush Ashuk Emre Ashuk, a former Turkish soccer star, married Yamush in 2012, a few years after his retirement. The couple had three children. Their life together seemed idyllic until Emre found that his wife had been having an affair and decided to file for divorce. 27-year-old Yamush started plotting to murder him in order to inherit his wealth. Enlisting the help of her lover, Erdi Shunge, the woman was extensively involved in preparing the assassination of her husband, in which Shunge was meant to act as the gunman. Yamush provided him with a gun and asked him to practice by shooting a piece of meat. Shunge ultimately couldn't go through with it and acted as a liaison between Yamush and an unnamed hitman. He was promised the equivalent of $1.2 million. Yamush gave him the weapon and even offered to help find secluded areas where to dispose of the body. At the last moment, the hitman had a change of heart and told Emre, his intended target, about the murder plot. Yamush and Shunge were arrested and charged with attempted murder. Number 7. Adolf Kors III Adolf Kors III, CEO and heir to the Kors Brewing Company fortune, was murdered during a failed kidnapping attempt in 1960. On February the 6th, the 45-year-old left home for work. The police would later find his car abandoned on Turkey Creek Bridge near Morrison, Colorado. The following day, his wife received a note demanding $500,000 for his safe release. What followed was one of the largest investigative efforts in FBI history, stretching from California to Vancouver, Canada. In September, Kors' remains were found in the Rocky Mountains. The evidence and witness testimonies the FBI had gathered led them to escaped murderer Joseph Corbett Jr. He'd spent some time in a maximum security prison for shooting a man in the back of the head 
which he alleged had been in self-defense. He then escaped custody following a transfer to a minimum security facility. The authorities released wanted posters and a woman in Vancouver identified a man of Corbett's description living in her area. He was tracked down and arrested. The key piece of evidence in his conviction was dirt from his car with a composition of granite minerals and rare pink feldspar, typical of the area where Corbett's remains had been found. Corbett was sentenced to life with the possibility of parole. He always maintained his innocence and was released in 1980 for good behavior. In 2009, at the age of 80, he committed suicide. He lived and died just 10 miles from where he'd killed Coors. Number 6. Helene Pastor Billionaire Helene Pastor, the granddaughter of property magnet Jean-Baptiste Pastor, was the richest woman in Monaco. She and her family owned 15% of Monaco's housing stock. On May the 6th of 2014, she was being driven from a hospital in Western Nice when a gunman opened fire on her car. Her chauffeur died from his gunshot injuries. Pastor was in a coma for several weeks but eventually passed away as well at the age of 77. In June of 2014, her son-in-law, Wojciech Janowski, admitted to ordering the shooting. The motive was gaining access to the immense fortune through Pastor's daughter, Sylvia, who was his common-law wife. Janowski would later retract his admission, claiming he hadn't understood the questions he'd been asked in French by the police. He maintained that he was innocent, but in 2018, a few weeks into his trial, formally admitted to ordering the hit through his lawyer. He was sentenced to life in prison. Number 5. Fahim Saleh Entrepreneur Fahim Saleh who was known as the Elon Musk of the developing world, initially made his fortune as a self-taught programmer. He then co-founded the ride company Pathal, popular in Bangladesh and Nepal, as well as Gokada, a ride-hail startup for motorbike taxis, popular in Nigeria. These were just some of the business ventures through which Saleh had amassed close to $150 million by the time he was only 33 years old. On July the 13th of 2020, Neighbors heard shouting coming from Saleh's luxury apartment on Manhattan's Lower East Side. They called his sister, who arrived at the apartment the following day to find a gruesome scene. Saleh's limbs and head were in garbage bags, while his torso was found next to an electric saw. He'd been stabbed to death prior to dismemberment. It's believed that the killer was cleaning the scene when he was forced to flee, interrupted by Saleh's sister. Only a few days later, the CEO's personal assistant, 21-year-old Tyrese Devon Haspil, was arrested for the killing. Using Saleh's credit card, he'd bought an electric saw and cleaning supplies at Home Depot after the murder. An investigation revealed a possible motive. Saleh had discovered that Haspil had stolen thousands of dollars from him. He didn't report the theft, but instead set up a plan for Haspil to pay him back. Nevertheless, Haspil murdered him, according to the police. The trial is ongoing and the suspected killer has yet to have been convicted. Number 4. Jarse Dwayne Ricardo Onfroy American rapper Jarse Dwayne Ricardo Onfroy, known to those who followed his music as XXX Tentacion, was gunned down in June of 2018. Onfroy had earned a cult following through his music and was worth at least $5 million at the time of his death. He was browsing motorcycles at Riva Motorsports in Deerfield Beach, Florida. Two men followed him into the store, where they bought two face masks. Onfroy then got into his black BMW i8 and started driving away from the dealership. Shortly afterwards, he was blocked from exiting the parking lot by a Dodge Journey SUV. Two men exited the vehicle and approached the rapper as he sat in the passenger seat. After a brief struggle, Onfroy was shot multiple times in the neck. From the rapper's vehicle, the attackers took a Louis Vuitton bag containing approximately $50,000 in cash. Onfroy was taken to a Deerfield Beach hospital, where he was pronounced dead. Four suspects were arrested in the aftermath, including alleged triggermen Trayvon Newsom and Michael Boatwright, with the latter believed to have delivered the fatal shot. Number 3. Edouard Stern Throughout a career that spanned roughly three decades, French banker Edouard Stern 
had amassed a fortune of over $1 billion. Stern was known for his brilliant business ideas but also for his eccentric lifestyle. On March the 1st of 2005, his body was found in his Geneva apartment. He'd been shot four times. Stern was still wearing a latex bodysuit and had an adult toy inserted in his body from what had apparently been a sadomasochistic bondage session. The killing was traced back to Cecile Broussard, Stern's longtime lover, whom some media outlets described as a high-end escort. The murder weapon, Stern's own revolver, and the dominatrix outfit that Broussard had worn were recovered from Lake Geneva. According to court documents, she'd asked him to transfer $1 million into her account as proof of his love for her. An argument ensued, at which point Stern was shot in the head. Broussard confessed to the killing, but her defense argued it had been a crime of passion and not one motivated by money. She was sentenced to eight years in prison and released on parole in November of 2010. Today's topic was requested by Romela Kami. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Edmond Safra In December of 1999, the death of billionaire banker Edmond Safra attracted widespread media attention due to the mysterious circumstances in which it occurred. The 67-year-old was at his luxury Monaco penthouse, where he felt safe enough that he hadn't asked his team of bodyguards to stay the night. At his home, Safra was joined by his nurse, Vivian Torrente, and Ted Mayer, a former Green Beret turned registered nurse. A fire broke out at the heavily fortified residence which rapidly expanded, causing Safra and Torrente to be suffocated by the fumes. Mayer told the authorities that the property had been attacked by two masked intruders. He admitted to having deliberately set off the fire, hoping that by doing so he'd trigger Safra's complex security system, which he didn't know how to operate. He had cuts on his body that appeared to corroborate his story. It later emerged that Mayer had started the fire in a bizarre attempt to increase his standing with his boss and earn a promotion. He was hoping to orchestrate a daring rescue but lost control of the blaze. Mayer's knife injuries had also been self-inflicted. In 2002, for the arson deaths of Safra and Torrente, he was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Number 1. Osage Nation and the Reign of Terror In the late 19th century, massive oil reserves were discovered in present-day Osage County, Oklahoma, on land owned by the Osage Nation. Through the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the tribe entered an agreement with the U.S. government through which portions of their territory were leased for oil exploration and production. By the 1920s, with rising oil prices, the Osage grew incredibly wealthy. In 1923 alone, the tribe took in more than $30 million, which today would amount to hundreds of millions. They became the richest people per capita in the world an aspect that was widely advertised in contemporary media. They lived in mansions, bought expensive cars, clothes, and jewelry, vacationed to Europe or sent their children to private schools. The newfound prosperity of Osage County attracted legitimate entrepreneurs but also criminals, who were seeking to separate the tribe from their wealth. It also challenged preconceived notions about Native Americans, some of whom had white servants at the time. The U.S. Congress then decided that the Osage weren't prepared to handle or protect their riches. It passed a law that required courts to appoint guardians from local white businessmen or lawyers. They were meant to manage the oil royalties and financial affairs for Osage of half-blood or more in ancestry until they proved a supposed competency. The decision would open a gateway for extreme criminality. In the 1920s, the tribe fell under what the press would label as a reign of terror. Since Osage shares couldn't be sold but only inherited, their guardians maneuvered to come into possession of their land or royalties. Unprotected by local law enforcement, some were swindled but many were outright killed. By 1925, at least 60 wealthy Osage had died with their deeds or land inherited by their guardians. The Bureau of Investigations, which would later become the FBI, identified a market for contract killing in the county. The Osage death toll is suspected of being in the hundreds, but few of the murders were reported or investigated. A suit 
initiated by the Osage Nation against the Department of Interior was settled in 2011 for $380 million and the promise of future improvement for management programs. Number 8. Oxford, USA, 2019. Aspiring pilot Elizabeth Lake Little was logging a solo flight in her home state of Mississippi from Golden Triangle Regional Airport to University Oxford Airport in July of 2019. She was practicing touch and go landing for her license. Over an hour had passed without incident until the final moments when she was forced to abort the landing after approaching from the wrong direction. Evident panic streamed from her voice as she radioed with the control tower, but there was nothing they could do as her plane took a nosedive into a neighboring golf course. Preliminary reports weren't clear as to what had caused the crash, but flight instructor Robert Katz believed it could have been avoided and blamed poor training. Little was trying to land the Cessna 172 with a tailwind, while experienced pilots of small aircrafts know to go against the wind to control speed. In addition, the wing flaps used during landing and takeoff to supply lift were retracted, potentially explaining the plane's sudden and fatal downward trajectory. She survived the initial crash, but suffered severe burns and succumbed to her injuries later that day. Number 7. Channel of Alderney, 2019 In January of 2019, Emiliano Sala, a professional soccer player from Argentina, signed a new contract to play for Cardiff City from Nantes FC with a club record transfer fee of an estimated £15 million. Two days after signing on January the 21st, he boarded a plane to make his move official, never to be seen alive again. The Piper PA-46 Malibu plane went off the radar just north of the island of Guernsey, UK, and wasn't relocated for another 13 days. It was eventually found at a depth of 220 feet in the English Channel of Alderney. Salah's body was still amongst the wreckage, while David Ibbotson's, the pilot, was never found. Salah himself had identified potential red flags. Before takeoff, he sent a voice message to a friend saying, I am now on board a plane that seems like it is falling to pieces. If you do not have any more news in an hour and a half, I don't know if they need to send someone to find me. I am getting scared. The plane then crashed after breaking apart mid-flight. It was later revealed that the pilot was crucially underqualified and inexperienced to fly the aircraft, especially at night and in poor conditions. A faulty exhaust pipe might have caused carbon monoxide poisoning in both occupants, but ultimately, the aircraft fell apart due to flying at a speed significantly faster than designed to. In June of that same year, a man was arrested on suspicion of manslaughter in connection to the crash, but was released with no further action. In the aftermath, Cardiff FC and Nantes FC reportedly argued over Salah's transfer fee. Number 6. Martha's Vineyard, USA, 1999 John F. Kennedy Jr. was taking his wife Carolyn and his sister-in-law Lauren Bassett from Fairfield, New Jersey to Hyannis Port, Massachusetts on July the 16th of 1999. For his nephew's wedding, flying in his Piper Saratoga aircraft, they followed the coastline, intending to drop Lauren off at Martha's Vineyard. However, after checking in with air traffic control earlier, they failed to show up. The US Coast Guard started an official search and rescue at 4 a.m., hours after Kennedy's scheduled arrival. They were not optimistic, as several pieces of the plane had been seen littered across the coastline. Six days later, on the afternoon of July the 21st, the wreckage and all three bodies were found still strapped into their seats, under and around the fuselage. There were no navigational or mechanical issues discovered in the final report determined the cause to be pilot inexperience and loss of control, despite Kennedy having over 300 logged hours. Although it was a foggy and hazy night, Kennedy had turned down the offer of one of his instructors coming along to help, insisting he could manage alone. It's suspected that in conditions of low visibility, he lost sight of the horizon and became disorientated. He would have had to rely completely upon his instruments, a skill not yet mastered. Radar showed the plane plummeting 1,100 feet in 14 seconds before disappearing. Kennedy Jr., who was known for his charming good looks and being the crown prince of one of America's most esteemed families, was mourned by many. Number 5. Abaco Islands, Bahamas, 2001 August 25, 2001, famous Miami-born singer and actress Aaliyah 
boarded a twin-engine Cessna 402 aircraft destined for Florida. Three days prior, she had jetted off to the Bahamas to shoot an exclusive music video for her upcoming song, Rock the Boat. Finishing her scenes a day early, Aaliyah and an entourage of seven decided to charter a flight back to Miami before the rest of the production crew. Emotions were high as the aircraft arrived almost two hours late. Impatient to take to the sky, the aircraft was loaded and set to take off, something it would never achieve. The plane crashed just 200 feet from takeoff, killing everyone on board. Only certified to carry six passengers, the flight was taking eight, all with equipment, meaning it was doomed from the start. Shockingly overlooked, the pilot was not qualified to fly the plane, had falsified documents, and his autopsy revealed traces of cocaine and alcohol in his system. There are reports that Aaliyah had expressed concern about the safety of flying in and out of the Bahamas to her boyfriend, who'd advised her not to travel. There are also reports of overheard arguments between passengers and the pilot about weight concern, with the pilot advising not to fly and passengers pushing to continue. Aaliyah was only 22 and one of the most famous people in the world at the time. Number 4. Scottsdale, USA, 2018 On April the 9th of 2018, six people lost their lives in a ball of fiery wreckage after the single-engine Piper PA-24 Comanche plane they were in failed to maintain sufficient airspeed after takeoff. The plane belonged to student pilot James Pedroza, but it's unclear whether he was the one flying the plane as he was joined by Eric Valente, an experienced pilot and instructor. The four remaining passengers were Maria Sunshine Coogan, Anand Patel, Helena Lagos and Iris Rodriguez Garcia, who were all budding Instagram stars and models with thousands of followers each. Although confirming everything to be all good to air traffic control moments before, their flight from Phoenix to Las Vegas ended only 70 seconds after takeoff as they hurtled to the ground in Scottsdale, Arizona. Evidence of cocaine and ecstasy were found in James Pedroza's blood, but it was impossible to timestamp if it had been ingested before or during the flight. A broken spring from a cylinder valve was also discovered, but the main cause was concluded to have been the aircraft being 135 pounds overweight and off balance. Number 3. Columbus, USA, 2008 Blink-182 drummer Travis Barker and Adam DJAM Goldstein were trying to fly from Columbus, South Carolina to Los Angeles, California on September the 19th of 2008 but never made it off the ground. While speeding along the runway, one of the plane's wheels burst and the pilot was forced to abort the takeoff. With one tire out, the plane was out of control. It veered back and forth and ran off the runway into a nearby highway before finally crashing into an embankment. It burst into flames immediately and four people were killed. Barker and Goldstein were able to jump out of the emergency exit before it crashed, escaping with their lives. Travis jumped out right into a spray of jet fuel, covering himself. Running and ripping off his clothes in the middle of the highway, he finally dropped and rolled, killing the fire but not before it covered 65% of his body with third-degree burns. He spent 11 weeks in hospital and said he'd swallowed so much fuel that he was burping up jet fuel for almost three months. The mental toll was arguably as bad as the physical. Goldstein unfortunately died in an overdose just a year later and Barker was diagnosed with PTSD. He has never set foot on a plane again since. Today's topic was requested by Gavin Todd. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Leon Township 2021 On January the 2nd of 2021, a small private plane carrying a family of three crashed into a house in Leon Township, a suburb of Detroit killing all occupants. The plane crashed into the living room of the house and quickly set the whole place ablaze. Miraculously, everyone at the residence, except the family cat, survived unscathed, despite being home at the time. David Compo, the owner of the single-engine Piper PA-24, was an experienced pilot, taking his family home after a visit to Georgia. They were cleared to start their descent into Willow Run Airport in Ypsilanti, and were assured by air traffic control that they could always land at another nearby airport if necessary. David Campo was not instrument rated in poor weather, and it was the dead of winter, but he decided to give it a shot anyway. The plane descended to 1900 feet before violently spiraling to the left 
multiple times and crashing a half a mile from the runway. Number 1. Oahu, USA 2019 The most deadly US civil aviation accident of the last decade was a skydiving plane crash in 2019 in Hawaii, resulting in the death of 11 people. Everyone was quick to blame the pilot, Jerome Renk, who was known to be an aggressive flyer. In the past, Renk would try maneuvers far beyond his training as an extra thrill ride for customers. One of these maneuvers was to pitch at a steep angle and climb aggressively right after takeoff. In June, the Beach King Air 65 A90 aircraft was seen aggressively taken off before stalling and fatally crashing. The US National Transportation Safety Board reported that the stall and subsequent loss of control were at too low of an altitude for Rank to have recovered from, but they weren't quick to point blame. The report didn't name any single cause for the crash, as investigations found other factors that had potentially contributed. For one, the skydiving company Oahu Parachute Center didn't even hold the right permits to legally take people out. George Riviera, the company owner, was granted a permit for parachute repairs and riggings back in 2010, but it was under a different company name. It was also found that the aircraft had been in a stall and spin incident in 2016, in which skydivers had to preemptively jump out. The left wing was damaged and never adequately repaired, negatively impacting its mid-air stall margin. The investigation brought to light the disappointing regulatory standards of the Federal Aviation Administration and its general unawareness of subsequent subpar training given to pilots. Number 7. Sam Heslop While joining her boyfriend on his catamaran on the night of March the 7th of 2021, Sam Heslop from Britain disappeared. Moored off the coast of the US Virgin Islands, the couple had been seen enjoying dinner in St. John's before returning to the 47-foot yacht. At around 2.30 a.m. that night, police received a call from her boyfriend, Ryan Bain, who reported he'd woken up to find her missing. He was advised to contact the US Coast Guard, which he did, but only about nine hours later. Other than contacting a personal attorney, questions were raised as to what he did during the prolonged period, but Bain refused detectives' inquiries, as well as entry onto his boat. Blocked from that vein of information, investigators conducted an extensive underwater search of the coast, which lasted for days but yielded no results. Despite charging Bain with obstruction of justice, the only statement he made was to suggest she'd fallen off the boat, a theory family and friends of Heslop found very difficult to accept. Anchored close to the coast, the luxury yacht was in shallow waters, and even with perfect visibility, no trace of a body was found. Other concerning details continued to emerge as the investigation went on. Previously convicted on charges of domestic violence, Bain's ex-wife came forward to describe him as quick to anger, narcissistic, and aggressive with girls. Publicizing her darkest days, she hoped to help the investigation in any way she could. Unfortunately, even with a report from someone saying they'd heard a woman scream while out walking their dogs on the night, no concrete evidence could place her on the boat. After months of investigations, Bain disappeared from the area without any trace. Authorities publicly appealed for him to return and help, but he remained out of their sights and grasp. Number 6. Sinead McNamara 20-year-old Instagram influencer Sinead McNamara had been working on a luxury super yacht touring the Isles of Greece in 2018 when she was found hanging from the boat, unresponsive. Having sold all her belongings to travel, McNamara had been part of the vessel's staff since May and was working her last shift before reuniting with her mother and sister to continue traveling. Hours away from the reunion, she was discovered by a passing boat, tangled in rope off the back of the yacht. She was still alive and given CPR, but died while being airlifted to the hospital. Already en route from Australia to meet McNamara, her mother and sister found out about her passing mid-air on their flight to Greece. With no signs of struggle or physical abuse, a Greek coroner ruled the cause of her death as hanging, but admitted the case wasn't clear-cut. On the night in question, the boat was only manned by staff after its owner, Mexico's second richest man, billionaire Alberto Bayeris, had disembarked days prior. Despite insisting she was happy during their regular talks, Sinead's mother reported she had called the day before, crying about having fallen out with another crew member. Greek Coast Guards investigating the death questioned the staff but ultimately allowed the super yacht to sail away. CCTV footage 
display in the moments before McNamara's discovery was allegedly seized, but the video was never shared publicly or with the case's ruling coroner. The particularities of what had happened to her that night have remained a mystery. Number 5. Thomas and Jackie Hawks A retired couple from Prescott, Arizona, Thomas and Jackie Hawks lived full-time on their 55-foot yacht, well-deserved, for two years while they sailed around the Pacific Ocean. In 2004, motivated by the upcoming birth of their first grandchild, they decided to move back on land and sell their yacht. Their newspaper ad was answered by Skylar De Leon, who presented himself as a serious buyer and family man, gaining their trust by bringing along his pregnant wife and young daughter, the former child star and Power Ranger, convinced the older couple to take him, his family, and two male friends out on a test cruise before finalizing the sale. As soon as they got out to sea, the group, led by De Leon, overpowered the couple, handcuffed them to an anchor, and threw them overboard. Neither was ever seen again, but the boat and their car were returned to their usual spots. In the aftermath, De Leon insisted everyone had returned safely after the sale had been finalized, but his story fell through when the notary, who had signed as a witness to the sale, revealed she had been bribed. The story unraveled completely when one of his accomplices confessed in exchange for a plea deal. Along with outlining how they were killed, he detailed how De Leon first forced the Hawks to fingerprint and sign documents that gave him power of attorney and transferred the boat to his name. With the testimony, De Leon and the third male accomplice were found guilty on multiple charges in connection to the murders. They were given the death penalty, while his wife will serve multiple life sentences with no chance of parole. Number 4. Karen Barnes After dating David Trauger for just a few months, Karen Barnes quit her job as a restaurant manager to marry him in 2009. Following this short love affair, Karen filed for divorce just two and a half years later and to her ex's displeasure was granted their 558,000 custom-built yacht in the proceedings. She moved into the vessel full-time, unaware that it would leave her vulnerable to David's abuse. Dealing with constant harassment and stalking, Karen filed multiple police reports and a protective order against him, only to take matters into her own hands when authorities couldn't locate him. She secretly moved the yacht to St. Mary's, but was found out soon after. In the early hours of August the 13th of 2012, David, dressed in all black, approached the yacht on a small vessel and proceeded to light it on fire, destroying the yacht and everything inside. Tragically, that also included Karen and one other victim. Spotted days later by chance outside an apartment complex, David started a shootout after being confronted by the police. No officers were injured, but David was killed in the fire exchange. David's attorney came forward later in his defense, given a wildly different perspective of the events leading up to the tragedy. He claimed David and Karen's divorce was meant to be a sham to protect the yacht against David's first ex-wife, to whom he still owed a lot of money. David's attorney believed after Karen acquired the yacht and unexpectedly split instead of returning to be with David. Regardless of his true motive, David Trauger was categorically at fault for taking the lives of two people. Number 3. Jake Feldwehr On the final day of the 2019 Cannes Film Festival, British sailor Jake Feldwehr lost his life in a yacht crash. Feldwehr had just completed the basic super yacht training program and spent the previous four weeks exploring the south of France. The crash occurred at around 9 p.m. between super yachts, the Vision and the Minx, who had both been chartered by one group to celebrate the final night of the festival. Feldwehr had been in charge of pulling up the anchor of the Minx, but as he did so, the other vessel crashed into the front, killing him. According to reports on the incident, the captain of the Vision was told to do some rounds while waiting for the Minx to pick up the anchor and was blamed for showing off. The Vision had been traveling at three times the speed limit and the Minx had been stationary in a safe anchorage zone at the time of the crash. The captain was charged with involuntary manslaughter, while the customers and crew members of the vessels were said to have been traumatized. After authorities left the blood-stained Minx in the harbor for weeks without cleaning it. Today's topic was requested by Miss Cheeky, if you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Edward Bozarth When Denise Bozarth was 24, she married 61-year-old Edward Bozarth. They were together for nine years, sharing two children, 
before things between them went awry in 2007. The whole family used to live together on a 36-foot cabin cruiser called Screw You 2. One day, a neighbor complained to police that they smelled a foul odor emitting from the boat. On July the 1st, when police investigated, they discovered the body of Edward Bozarth in an engine compartment wrapped in a canvas storage bag with the AC set to 60 Fahrenheit. An autopsy revealed he'd died from blunt force trauma to the head and had likely been left there for a week. Denise became the primary suspect, but upon questioning, told police that she'd asked Edward for a separation and had left to join her children in Panhandle, Florida, where her parents lived. She failed the polygraph test and her story was inconsistent, but detectives couldn't prove her guilt until 2012, when she confessed. Witnesses came forward claiming that Denise would often talk about killing her husband and the different ways she would do it. Edward had come into a hefty inheritance from his mother, and Denise had her eyes on it, as she would often tell friends around her. Eventually, a man living at the marina admitted he'd had an affair with Denise and claimed she'd offered him $10,000 to kill Edward, but he refused. She was convicted of his murder and sentenced to 14 years behind bars. Her excuse during the trial was simply that she'd snapped. Number 1. Mark Brennan At the age of 42, British window cleaner Mark Brennan decided he wanted to sail around the world on a solo adventure. He left the UK in 2020 and successfully made it across the Atlantic. He was seen sailing his 30-foot yacht Avrio between Grenada and Barbados on December the 2nd. A few days later at 8 p.m. on December the 6th, he was seen pulling his vessel out of the marina in darkness. The boat's dinghy had broken on the transatlantic trip, and the inexperienced sailor hadn't equipped the vessel with a phone or a radio. He was officially reported missing to British police on December the 21st, but it took weeks until he was found. The vessel was finally spotted by the local coast guard, drifting 71 nautical miles off the north coast of Jamaica. His naked, already decomposing body was found on board. Alongside the lack of communication devices and a dinghy, the Avrio had dirty fuel issues, which likely caused several engine problems, leaving it and Brennan to drift helplessly. Thanks for watching. Would you rather lose power on a yacht in the middle of the open ocean or lose control of your brakes while driving on the highway? Let us know in the comments section below.